So I remember a beautiful evening this last summer when in the middle of COVID crisis and isolation, it was one of those nights when it was no moon and the lights from the city are blocked by our house so that our backyard is a perfect place for looking at the stars. And Jan and I actually took a few moments to go out and just lay on our backs on the trampoline and look at the stars and it seems like they're so close. And, and you have that moment where you're thinking about how big the universe and how small I am and, and it's a, a wow moment like you experience when you go to the ocean or you're standing by a beautiful waterfall or many, many places in Oregon. But there's a jump between, wow, I'm enjoying this, and wow, God, which results in worship. And we have been talking about how to become better worshipers. And last week, Pastor Will talked about how we worship God in the difficult times, in times of conflict, in times of crisis, in times of confession. And this week, we want to walk, talk about how do we fuel our worship. So the title of the message is Worship Fuel. And how do we, through the everyday experiences of life, how do we fill this desire for knowing God better and exalting Him? And really, I think a good definition of worship is focusing on the greatness of God, to go from wow to wow God. And we're going to look at Psalm 19. If you have your Bibles, uh, open those up. Or if you want to open your YouVersion app, and we're going to look at Psalm 19, where David, that we talked about this last week, writes a psalm about two really huge things that can fuel our worship. And the first is the beauty and the majesty of nature, that God has designed it to be a, a searchlight pointing at Him, and then about the power of the Scriptures that we have. And so we're going to look at those two things, which are around us all the time or available to us, and how do we use those not only to become better worshipers, but to worship more consistently and more regularly. And I want to just show you a, a few pictures of the kinds of things that we can view right here in our neighborhoods that are pointing us towards God. And this is a, a picture of a night sky taken actually here in Roseburg with a, a time exposure lens of the Andromeda galaxy. And then you you know the many waterfalls we have around here and the beauty of water cascading over rocks and into pools. And then uh, I spent some time this summer doing some kayaking and going out on the beautiful Umpqua River. And now as the fall is turning and as we have seasons, there are, there are times when the magic of a place even gets enhanced more as it gets a touch of the fall leaves or a touch of snow. And we live in a place of incredible beauty but it's easy for us to take it for granted. It's easy for us to just drive by and be focused on, you know, I've got to get my coffee and I've got to get my stuff done. I've got to take care of the kids. And, and we can live in such an incredibly small bubble that we just crowd God out of it. And I'm inviting you and I'm inviting myself to take some moments and to stop and to say, I want to focus on God and His greatness. And I, I want to cultivate a sense of awe and of wonder and and I want to get away from those things that have become just commonplace and taken for granted. And I want to, usually you have to slow down and say, wow. But then I want to go one more step to, wow, God. And I'm going to read the first couple of verses of Psalm chapter 19. Again, this is written by King David. This is from somebody 3,000 years ago speaking into our lives today. He says, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. So, he had the same star as we do, and he's saying, when I look out at those, what I see is not just the beauty of the heavens, I see them yelling the glory of God. And glory is actually a word that the core meaning is weightiness or or the value, or the incredible greatness of something. And, and to worship is to focus on that value, to treasure it, to exalt it. And, and when we talk about God, he's saying what the creation is doing, what nature is doing, is without words and without speech, it's pouring out this incredible evidence of the goodness and the wonderfulness, of, or the, the wonder of God. And so, we are talking about not taking glory to ourselves or giving glory to others like 
athletes or politicians or, or famous people. We are, we are wanting to give glory to where it really belongs, and that is to God. And so he says, wherever you go, whatever place you are on this planet, you are able to see the skies. You're able to see creation, nature. You're able to see the beauty around you. And because of that, it should draw your attention. It should focus you on the greatness of God. And when I read Psalm 19, he says, the heavens declare the glory of God. And you realize everything we just watched has been the result of people discovering and finding facts about our micro-universe and facts about our macro-universe. David wouldn't have known even a tenth of that. So what he said is even more true, that when you see the complexity and yet the order, the fact that things are so huge, and yet there's the laws of gravity and the laws of magnetism and and the, the ways that the universe works together to make life on earth a perfect balance. And, and as I look at that, and as I look at the stars overhead, I think you are pushed to one of two conclusions. Either there is no God, it's way too big for any being to, to have created that and to be behind it, or you're moved to worship. Like, wow, my picture of God has been way too small. And, and the scriptures tell us that that Jesus holds the universe together. That at that subatomic level where those protons and neutrons and electrons are utterly interacting, that, that our God holds it together. And I invite you to begin to believe that and to find options where you begin to see the beauty of nature as a call to worship. That when you see the complexity of even the cells in a, in a leaf, when you see the ways that animals interact, when you see the, the ecosystem that we're a part of, that you say, wow, God, thank you. And that you allow your picture of God to grow bigger. The Apostle Paul said essentially the same thing in Romans chapter 1. And he specifically talked about that nature declares the glory of God in some specific ways. Romans chapter 120 says, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, and then he says, his eternal power and his divine nature. Two specific things that we can know from, about God from nature. It says they have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. You say, people who've never even heard of Jesus or of the Bible They have the the Bible of nature in front of them. They have no excuse. And he says, specifically, we can know about his eternal power. And you look at the incredible complexity of the world and how big it is, and you think of whatever it took to create that or to bring it about. It must be an amazing power. And then when you look at the stars and how far they go, and your mind scrambles with the ideas of infinity, how, how could that be millions of light years away? And our mind goes, because you just can't handle that big a number, that big a concept. And the same thing with time. How could God have always been? Or if, if the universe started, what was before that? And those eternal questions bring us to the place that there must be a power, a force, a, a God of some kind. And then he says, The second thing we can discern is his divine nature. And that was a puzzle to me for a while because how do you know things about God from nature? We know that God is a trinity. We don't know that from nature. We know that Jesus came to bear the sins of the world. We don't know that from nature. That Nature doesn't teach us about those things. So how does nature teach us about God? And, you know, I think the simplest answer is realize that exhibit A is us that we are the pinnacle of nature, if you will. We are the the most self-aware, most complex beings on the planet. And what does this tell you about God? And I think it's fascinating when you start realizing, even from the scripture, where it says that God created us in his own image. And you don't get beings that have personality, that have self-awareness, that are looking for purpose from a impersonal force. A radio wave doesn't create personality. 
And so you look at human beings and you realize with the personality that we have and with the, the desire for relationship and the interconnectedness and all of those tell us something about what created us. So we can know something about God's divine nature from looking at human nature. We, we know that people are creative, not only creative in terms of being able to survive and finding clever ways to survive against all odds, but that there is something beyond survival, that there is a desire for beauty and there is an appreciation of beauty, that when you and I look at a sunset, we have a different response than a snail does or a bird does because there's something within us that's created to enjoy beauty and, and be drawn to that. And in fact, it's beyond that. It, there's, a, there's a desire in us to create such that almost every household in America has kids that sit around and, and they love to use Duplos or Legos and to make stuff. And, and boy, I tell you, you can make some amazing things. And this is Jan's car, by the way, out of our Lego bin. But to create things, there's a, a beauty and a wonder that we are able to tap into when we can make things. And in fact, one of the most popular video games that has been popular for years is Minecraft, which is mostly a game about creating things and passages and enjoying what other people have created. And part of all this is what brings us to say that must be a clue about who God is, that if we are like this, then we can know some things about God. And I think perhaps one of the most significant things as we come to what the God of the Bible is like is C.S. Lewis said that all human beings have moral motions. And that's a great term, moral motions, because he doesn't mean that we all see right and wrong exactly the same way, but he said all human beings have a concept that there are things right and there are things that are wrong. And it's more than just survival of our race. It's more than just survival of our species. It's that there are things that are wrong, that a powerful person beating a, a, a powerless person is wrong, whatever that means. And so he talks about that that creates the realization that God has moral motions as well. In fact, that the reason we have a right and a wrong concept is because the God who created us. So what that means is that looking at nature and looking at human nature, we can see a lot of that's about the truth of a lot of things that are true about God. And in fact, I think it answers a question that often people ask. Well, what about people who've never heard about the Bible? What, what about people in far off Ecuador or live in the, the remote areas of Tibet? And the answer is they have creation. They have, they have nature that points to God. And I believe that if people respond to the nature that they see, that God will provide them enough information for salvation. And there are multiple stories of God coming to people in visions or sending angels, not only in the New Testament and in terms of like the Apostle Paul, but, but also in our world that some people see visions of God and that leads them to believe. Or God sends missionaries to particular places and they say, we've been waiting for you because we've been waiting for the God that made this world. And so if God is giving his voice through everywhere, then it's even more important that we get more knowledge because when we respond to the God of nature, we want to know more. And you know what the answer to more is? Well, it's also in Psalm 19 where he talks about the scriptures declare the wisdom of God. There's a whole lot we can know about God from nature, but there's a whole lot we can't know about God. And the heart of a true worshiper says, I want to know him more. I want to be more clear and more understanding. And so as he's walking through Psalm 19, he says, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. We used to sing a song when I was in high school from Psalm 19, and that's imprinted it on my heart, that there's these two tracks that lead us to worship. One is the track of nature and seeing the beauty of the world around us. And, and the other is the, the majesty and the wonder of Scripture. And I believe that we take this way, way too much for granted. If you realize how few believers through the centuries 
had more than just one little part of the Bible or, or were even unable to read if it was written down. And that you and I are blessed with an incredible amount of access to the words of God. And that the Bible itself is an incredibly unique book so that people who would even be atheists should be fascinated by how the Bible's put together because there's no other book like it. Let me give you a couple of just facts about the Bible to whet your appetite. The Bible is written by 40 different authors, different people. They were from different continents in different languages, from different cultures. And it was literally written over about 1,500 years. And so you think about it's not a book. It is a, a whole encyclopedia of people's experiences with the same living God. And in all of that, it is the same united message all the way through that there is a loving God who wants to redeem his people. And all the way through, the Bible has all kinds of characters that tell us about their relationship with God. And, and I love the fact, even as Pastor Will said last week, that, that the Bible is really honest about the characters that are interacting with God because it's not a bunch of cardboard saints who do everything right and say the right things. It's, it's real people like you and me that are wrestling through the messy parts of life and sometimes we fail and sometimes we succeed. But the, the story of the Bible is how imperfect people can have a relationship with a perfect God. How we can learn to not only know about Him, but to respond with awe and worship and submission. And that out of that, the Scriptures lead us to deeper and deeper worship of God. And, and, I, and I would encourage you to pick up your Bible this week and just say, God, thank you that your eternal words have not only been written down, but they've been preserved so that I have a copy in my hands. And you know, if you think back to the ways in which the, the Bible was transmitted to us, originally it was written by hand, and it was written on paper or on sheets of animal skin, and it was copied year by year by year, century by century, by people with, a, with an incredible commitment to accuracy and we have multiple copies from all over the world. And then finally, when Gutenberg had a, a printing press in 1450, one of the first books he printed was copies of the Latin Bible. And in fact, when David says it's worth more than gold, they, they believe that a, a copy of the original Gutenberg Bible would now be worth about $35 million. It's valuable. And on top of that, it is the best seller of all time. In fact, in our current age, as the YouVersion Bible, and if you don't already have that downloaded on your phone or on your computer, let me encourage you to do that because it's an amazing uh, way in which the, you can access the Scripture right from the phone that's in your pocket. And it's been downloaded over 4 million times. There are 2,000 versions in it of, in over 1,400 languages now. And it's amazing. Some of them, you can just have it read to you. You can have it play on your car, in your car when you're driving, or you can just listen, and they will read the words of Scripture to you. We have an incredible wealth of the Bible that's accessible to us. Sadly, I'm not sure we access it that much. I think there's a constant battle because we have access to so many other things too. But the truth is it's the bestseller of all time. A hundred million Bibles are sold every year. They believe that there's over 5 billion Bibles that have been sold. That is just above all bestsellers ever. And at least 2,100 languages have the Bible, at least one book of the Bible in their language. Thanks in part to the, to the Wycliffe missionaries and the many other missionaries who are giving their lives so that a, a new group of people can have the words of God in their own language. I, I hope that by talking about it, it brings you again to say, wow. And then maybe to say, wow, God, thank you that you've spoken infallible, inerrant words into our world. And, and people have sacrificed so that we could have it in our own language and so that it could be transmitted down incredibly faithfully over thousands of years. We're reading a psalm from David that would have been copied many, many times and you and I have a copy of it in our hands. And he says a couple of things we can talk about the Scriptures. He says several about them, but he says the first line is that it refreshes the soul. And I love that picture that, 
that sometimes people come to the Bible as a rule book, and it does have rules. It, in fact, has all kinds of literature. It's got stories, autobiographies, biographies. There's, there's poetry. There is books of wisdom. There's books of prophecy for telling the future. It's an incredible collection of different kinds of literature. But more than that, it's about a living book that refreshes our soul. And I think sometimes people come to it as an intellectual thing to learn, or they come to it as a foundation for arguing about things, or they come as a rule book, or they come even as a religious duty. I've got to read the Bible so I can check it off. And let me encourage you, first of all, to come to it as spiritual food for your soul. That when you come to the Scriptures, there's something about it that, that brings life to your, to your spiritual life that should fuel that worship. And I think of that in my own life, and I think of so many times over the years when, especially when things are really hard. And I remember a, a particularly dark time in my ministry life, and, and I remember coming back to a, a passage of Scripture in Second Chron- or Second Corinthians chapter 4. And I'd actually worked on memorizing this in Spanish, which kind of gave it to me in a, in a different feel. But The Apostle Paul said, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. And in reference to that, I I read a a powerful statement by a pastor, and he said, you know, I finally had to come to the place that on every church door, there's not only the blood of Jesus, there's some of the blood of the pastor. And he said, you know, for myself, if Jesus shed his blood for his church, why wouldn't I? And just that identification of Paul, who had labored so hard to get these churches up off the First of all, to plant them and then to keep them from all the false teaching that was there. And, and he was literally bleeding for them. And he said, you know what? It's painful. It's difficult. It's a struggle. But we carry about the death of Jesus in our lives so that the life of Jesus might be manifest. And there's something powerful about those words and about a shared experience with somebody from a couple thousand years ago. And you think, Wow. The Bible transports me to a world outside of my own. We get so caught in my thoughts and my feelings and my experience and what I want. And the Bible takes us out of that. And he says, not only does it refresh our souls, but he says, the precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. And he talks specifically about how it brings truth to our lives. And you know, we watch culture changing all around us and all kinds of labels are being changed and values are being changed. And it's like, how do we, how do we keep our way and keep an anchor in the middle of incredible, incredible current? And you go back and you say, how do we find out the truth? And I'll tell you this, worship will always go astray unless it's anchored in the scripture. You know, I, I was watching a, a Buddhist spokesperson on TEDx talk and, and he was explaining their philosophy of life, and and some of it makes a lot of sense from a completely human point of view. But then they also add in reincarnation, and they add in all kinds of other things that, that are not true. And we look at the Scriptures, and it tells us when we talk about sexuality, what what God's picture of sexuality is. When we talk about marriage, what God's picture of marriage is. When we talk about when does life start, what does God say about that? And we come back to capital T Truth. And you know what's going to hold you against all the back and forth changes of culture, which is experimenting with making up their own truth and making up their own gods. And we come back to the scriptures and it tells us the truth and it anchors us. And you can say, this isn't my idea. This isn't, I'm so glad I'm right. This is, I'm so glad God has communicated to us and that he's right. And so he goes on in the Psalm and he says, it's more valuable than gold and it's sweeter than honey. And you think about in our lives, that what does it mean to worship God? One of the deepest words for it is it means to treasure Him, to, to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, to, to seek God. 
and everything else is of lower value. You think of how much time we spend to, to try to put money in our savings account, to try to purchase things that we want, to, to try to keep up with the Joneses. And David, who, who ended up being a very wealthy king, he said, you know what's more valuable? Having God's Word, having it in our lives and having it valued. I tell you, when I get up in the morning and I open my iPad, I have a temptation because the news button is right there and my version Bible button is right there. And when I hit the news first, man, within just a few moments, my mind is filled with all of the threats of the COVID crisis, with all the restrictions, with all of the divisions, with all the things that are going on. And, and you can just see that it agitates your soul. But when I open up the scriptures first, and when I get God's perspective, and when I get a big picture of God, then when you hit the news, then when you hit the, the various opinions of the day, you've got a foundation and a rock. And, and I would encourage you to begin to treasure God's word more. That's one of the best things you can do in all of these difficulties is let the scriptures become more and more precious to you by memorizing them, by reading them more than just once a day, by by talking about them with, uh, to other people, by letting it actually be the most valuable words that are in your head. And I don't know about you, but my thoughts go all over in the course of a day, and I need God to keep bringing me back to the truth. And it really is sweeter than honey. And then at the end of this psalm, and I love the way this ends, he says, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Those are words that David uses often, that, God, you are my rock and my shelter and my fortress. And in the middle of all of the ups and downs of life, you are the one that I can trust. But I love that he also asked the question that I asked you two weeks ago, which was, not just does your worship make you feel better, but is your worship pleasing to God? And David says, as I look at creation, I'm going to say, wow, God. And, and as I look at the scripture, I'm going to say, wow, God. And in the middle of that, I still know that I make it about me and I get so distracted. And so, Lord, please make the meditation of my heart and, and help me to be a worshiper and <laughs> take the, the worship as it is. It's not perfect. It's not what you deserve. But please may it be acceptable in your sight. What a humble way to come and say, God, here's the best I've got. I hope that today it pleases you. I hope that worship today is for you and about you. So my challenge to you and my challenge for us this week is that every time you see the beauty of nature, you would say, wow, God, and let that build your sense of thankfulness and awe and, and, and wonder at who God is and what he's given to us and what he's done. And as you read the scriptures, as we remember Jesus, that he came and he gave his life for us so that we could have life eternal and he gave his words so that we could have truth. And that you would spend time treasuring and valuing and, re and reflecting on the words of God so that your mind is filled with the words of God instead of the words of man. And it will lead you to be a worshiper who can worship in spirit and in truth. So I'm going to release to the campuses and hand off as you just walk through a question that would be great for you guys to talk about to yourselves and to others this week.